Hey friends, so I've been doing like little slideshows. It's very primitive. In my day, we had Instamatic cameras, Kodak film, Kodachrome, Ektachrome, get it developed, and then make it into slides and then have slideshows. And nowadays, it's like I can create a slideshow viewable to the world from YouTube and using my Flickr photo stream. And it's like it still seems like I'm just sharing a slideshow, but let's acknowledge the technology's gotten pretty powerful here. Now this last video I did, which was about Quakers and beer, I ended on this can. And here's the same can, but in a completely different part of the country. We're in Birmingham, Alabama. And if you've studied my Hypertune idea, the idea is kind of a spaghetti ball of scenarios, i.e. film clips, video segments, which can smoothly segue into each other thanks to what I call switch points, which are frames like this. You'd zoom in on this can and pull out and you're somewhere else. That would be kind of a primitive, almost a cheat, but you know, there are many ways to make hubs or nodes in the system. But what I really want to get to is the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum, and I want to talk a little bit about what I think we need to do regarding history, I think we need to keep it quite transparent for people to understand what's been going on. So in my brewery, in my beer video of earlier today, I shared a small little picture of what I think of when I think about prohibition and American history. And now we're thinking about civil rights. And how does that figure? And, you know, how, how was it when I grew up? And I could go on and on about my own personal history, and I might, you know, in some other video. But here, I'm taking us through a really great, I think, little museum. It's not vast, well-produced, in Birmingham, Alabama. And I think they took the right course, because I read in some magazines and stuff that a lot of people take the attitude, we need to uh, let the wounds heal by hiding this stuff and not talk about it anymore. Like by ending looking at any of the past, we can sort of heal from the past. The best strategy is to not talk about it. And the, the museum people had the opposite view. Let's get into excruciating detail. Let's really get into it because all the human patterns, there's so much we can learn. Like from every one of these chapters because Racism in the U.S., it's so similar and yet so different than you'll find in other places. Like, it's its good to juxtapose racisms, and this museum does a pretty good job of that. It doesn't, it, it does the most about exactly the experience that people were having in Birmingham, but then at the end of the museum it talks about other situations. There's too much to cover in one museum. So you see how we're looking at a white classroom. Let me go back. This is 1953, so they recreate, they do like a diorama. So here's a white classroom. And, you know, it's got that stereotypical checkerboard flooring. And I don't know, like this is what I'm fighting. I don't think you can learn math at a desk like this. As a little kid, maybe, but as you get older, you need a real personal workspace. And we're not making those yet. We don't seem to want to create the sort of integrated earphone display uh, gives you, I don't have a film, a film projector here. That's pretty obvious. So the disparity in ergonomics is what I'm looking at. Ergonomics drives economics. So these big guys from basketball, or excuse me, football team we're coming through here and like this is their first time to ever be at a civil rights museum and to really take in what has been going on like what in what way have black people been parodied by white people you know the whole thing with the black face and you know a certain way to to portray and um, make fun of or whatever these are things not to forget but to study, right? So that's my attitude and I think uh, the Civil Rights Museum did a great job. I know they had that huge 
snafu after I was there regarding Angela Davis, right? And I can't remember what was in this museum about Black Panther history. I don't remember enough, uh, but I certainly have studied that myself quite a bit. This is the kind of thing I mean, right? Pictures like this. Now they're all taken down because they're quote-unquote racist, but how are you going to understand racism if you don't see what racism has looked like through the ages, right? I'll end with what I think is a hallmark of racism, which is it's not just about physiological differences, but as soon as you start ascribing like ethical or sort of what people are like, as like, are they lazy? Are they industrious? Are they eager to please? All this kind of like personality characterizations. I would say that's definitely over the line because there are genetic differences. It's fine to acknowledge and see and talk about those, but then to assume all these sort of traits is kind of a strange, strange twist, you know, that so-and-so type of people are lazy, you know, there's a lot of ethnocentrism. I'll end with the thought that I thought that was partly what was driving Wittgenstein crazy in his British environment. These were his hosts. These were his adopted people. He called it the influenza, though. He, influenza, influenza zone. He was clearly unhappy being around his peers. And there's a story where he snaps at one point at the dinner table. They're all talking about how evil the Germans are and how the British were, would never be capable of such cruelty or something like that. And Wittgenstein just doesn't see it that way. Humans are humans. And I think he was kind of one of these, um, you know, he would have maybe been more of an Espensky guy if he had gotten, in, maybe he did get into fourth way stuff, but I have no record of that. I don't know if he did, but I think kind of trying to emerge out of a cultural identity and see your own tribe as anthropologically as you would see any tribe, that kind of alienation is what philosophy makes possible. And I think of, of Wittgenstein as a very advanced anthropologist who could turn the camera right way around onto his own thoughts. Very difficult to do. Anyway, it's the opposite of being a racist in some ways because you stop judging others by a double standard and all kinds of stuff like that. I like to think. He tried to emigrate to Russia, you know that? He tried to get away from, just start over in, in Russia, but they didn't want him. I, I, I don't know much about that story. Logi Comics has that story, and I should read up on what was going on there for him. I don't think he kept a journal of the usual kind where he wanted to have all kinds of like internal life kind of stuff going. Okay, so great museum. Thank you, Birmingham. You did a wonderful job. I look forward to visiting you again sometime. Bye-bye.